That's a pretty weak housing report. It is, yeah, but don't you think people are kind of waiting for the rates to come down a little bit now? It's that game where you know rates are coming down, you can get a better monthly so. mortgage payment on that. By the end of next year, you could see rates in the high fours or the low fives. Yeah. Do you really want to buy now? I could see that. David uh, is with me this morning, um, and you're looking at me kind of uh, skeptically. I have something to add to what Brian's saying. Please I do. I think it's about the seller that doesn't want to trade out of their 2 or 3% mortgage to have to go get a 6 or 7% right. mortgage. Mm. So the sellers have frozen the market. And now if rates come lower, they may be willing to move with a 4 or 5 mortgage, but not a 6 or 7. Right. Yeah, I can see that. That's a, uh, no, a very weak housing number. 3.86 million homes. It's, it's been homes weak sold. every weak. month for uh, about has. two years. Yes, it has. Indeed, it has. I remember the good old days, 2004, yeah. 2005. The good old days. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, everyone. Let's talk about the Fed rate cuts. I want you to listen to what Trump had to say about the Fed cutting 50 basis points. Rate cut. Roll it. What's your interest rates today? I guess it shows the economy is very bad to cut it by that much. Uh, assuming they're not just playing politics, the uh, economy would be very bad, or they're playing politics, one or the other, but it was a big cut. All right, Brian, is the Fed being political here? All Fed moves are political. They have to respond to the political environment. They are in a political environment with Biden and Harris and spending and regulation, and that has to dictate what they do. Uh, Bonson. Well, this is my favorite subject in the whole world. I knew the that. notion that it's political is just ridiculous. It's, I mean, they would have done it a year ago. It doesn't help them 60 days before. Immigration and inflation are her vulnerabilities, and the Fed can't do anything about those issues. The economic narrative is baked in. That's my view. David Bonson with me this morning. Do you think the Fed's got it right? Oh, I know you don't really care, but do you think they've got it right that we're heading for a soft landing? Um, I think that the Fed has no choice but to talk that way, and that they're trying to steer it. My view, Stuart, is that it's impossible for the Fed to know or for you or I to know. The Fed is trying to manage trillions of activities and, and complexities within the economy. I don't believe in them having the power to be in charge of full employment, of sound and stable money. Uh, the mandate's too large. Brian and I were talking about this on air yesterday. Uh, we need a more humble Fed. There you um, go. But is this rally here to stay? Oh, no. This, uh, and by the way, the NASDAQ is 700 points from its all-time high. If the NASDAQ doesn't make an all-time high with this news, that is not good. Um, the Dow and S&P, uh, right now, the S&P is at 21 times next year's earnings, assuming $280 of earnings. Why can't you let us all be happy? Uh, you We're can be happy. Money here. If you're buying <laughs> dividend growers, you're going to be fine. Oh. But no, no, th this is a very overheated deal, and um, people should just be aware of what they're paying. They're paying you 21 times. Okay, you think it's going to come down at some point? Yes, I do. How much? Um, I have no opinion about that whatsoever. But you know it's going to come down. I think that it's overvalued, Stuart, and it can go higher before it comes lower. But I just think overvaluation always corrects. So I'm making a basic economic statement. Overvalued on just on a profit basis? No, the, the, the way you have to pay to buy the profits. Yeah. Of the, uh, the technology sector right now is trading at 40-something times earnings. It's very high. Well, that's the technology sector. Yeah, the rest of the S&P X technology is not as expensive. That's true. You only invest in stocks which pay a high and growing dividend. A higher than the S&P dividend. But if I followed your advice, I would have ignored Microsoft for all these years. Well, no, Microsoft was a great dividend grower. Once uh, they cut the taxes on dividends... It doesn't pay much, does it? No, it was paying 3 or 4% for years. That was way back. No, but the dividend didn't come down, Stuart. This is the part that I've explained on air many times, and now we're going to get it right. Microsoft didn't cut their dividend. The stock price just went up a lot. So you're looking at a low yield. But if the, you look at the dividend of what Microsoft stock was, it's a very high dividend. That's so, what you want. So, okay. Should I buy more Microsoft now? You should have bought it when it was 3 or 4%. I did. D uh, should I buy more now? No. God, no. No, no, no. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> but it's great to have you on I'm the show. I'm just glad it's in your retirement account so that when you sell it, you won't have to pay Kamala Harris's capital gains taxes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I see Microsoft on my uh -huh, screen. On just the for you guys. Stay out of this, David. Uh -huh. uh, this is a huge story. Uh, They're partnering that. with a defense startup, yeah. a startup company, to develop combat goggles, mm -hmm. like uh, mixed reality goggles for the Army, to give them precision on the battlefield. That could bring in $22 billion in revenue over 10 years. You see, it's got nothing to do with the uh, Nothing dividend. to do with the dividend. Nothing to do with the dividend. Nothing to do with the dividend. Hold on a second. What do you mean? It's not to do with the dividend. What's the point of making the money if you're not going to return? Turn it to shareholders. Where's the money going to go? I will buy the stock because it's gone up $7 on news of a partnership. 
Isn't uh, that a good enough reason to buy it? Yeah, so you want to buy it after the announcement instead of before. Well, I've got a lot of it already. I'm not selling it. So you're not buying it. Leave me alone. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. David Barnes is still with me, and he's going back to his old favorites. He's picking a dividend-paying stocks, aren't you, David? Yeah, so they're not my old favorites. They're what we do. <laughs> it's a worldview for us, okay. dividend growers, okay. cash flow, American okay. enterprise, free okay. market. Yep, and I've made more money in Microsoft than you've made in dividends. How have you done in Blackstone? Very well. Yeah, thank you. I've got a 10 beller on that one. Yes, you have. Who I gave did. that one to you? Uh, as a matter of fact, it was uh, Mike Murphy. It was not. It okay. was David uh, let's continue. It was a, it's a dividend grower. Cisco, similar situation. Yeah. We bought it at about $16, and the dividend at the time was 3%. You go, I don't want a 3%. Now it's at $50, and the dividend on what we paid for it is about 18%. Then that's what dividend growth is for, is to get a dividend that's growing over time. And uh, ultimately, that's why stock prices go higher, is because cash flow is growing, earnings is growing. If they're not growing, then the stock price isn't growing. And if they are growing, they should be returning more of it to us to constantly de-risk our investment. Cisco's your st- the, the it, dividend it, pick it, of this It's one morning. that is only 17 times earnings when you've got to pay 50 times earnings for Microsoft. Yeah, well, I'm willing to pay it because I've got a capital gain. Moving on, David, uh, Leondel Bassett. We've had this one before. What do they do? Uh, they are uh, the largest maker in the country, petrochemicals, so it deals with commodities. Big factories out of Houston uh, definitely has exposure to what the price of oil or natural gas will be, but cosmetics, plastics, all these things are done by Lyondell. We love the company. It's vital to the American economy. It's not as exciting as a Microsoft or a tech company, but you got a dividend yield that's 5.7%, well, that's that has also been growing at almost 10% per year. Now, you perked my interest. 5% dividend yield, I like it. Okay. Moving on, David. Why buy utilities? I read your stuff, and that's what you're suggesting. Yes. Utilities. Why? So utilities are actually having their best year since 2014, the number one performing sector year to date. So I think utilities can give you downside protection, income potential, and also a way to play the AI revolution. Okay. Uh, you're nodding your head. You agree with that, don't oh, you? I fully agree. Yeah, and it's one right. thing I found out when I did the research in my dividend growth book. Utilities with dividends reinvesting have outperformed the NASDAQ for the last 40 years. So we think of the NASDAQ as this huge performer. It turns out those dividends matter, Stuart. Dividends do matter. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Kevin. It's great to have you on the My show. And you too, uh, David. Right. I want to bring back uh, Brian Bremberg and David Barnston on this. Uh, first to you, uh, Brian. Do you think the government, the president, the executive branch should intervene and stop this strike? Nope, because they don't make things better. I don't think Biden can do anything here to make this better. By the way, they're asking for, I think, a 77 percent pay increase over six years, 77 percent. And they say it's because of inflation. When the government gets involved, you get things like inflation and you hand unions a reason to ask for these things. This is the product of too much government intervention, not the absence of it. David, what Brian said. Over and over. He's exactly right. They're intervening, makes the problem worse, not better. It feeds an inflationary cycle. And here's the thing. It's none of President Biden's business. It just isn't. This is not a federal jurisdiction matter, period. The doctors feel they've got leverage because the Christmas and holiday season is coming up. Oh, and up. another thing, the election. election. And the election. That's, that's where they right. have leverage. Right. <laughs> they do have leverage. All right. Brian, David, thanks very much indeed. I've got a question for Brian Bremberg and David Bonson. Uh, to you first, David. Uh, should stadiums ban political messages on your shirt or your hat? Um, as long as they do it consistently, I wouldn't have a problem with it. If they own the property, they have a right to have that policy. The issue is I think the fans can get unruly. There's a lot of alcohol and, and issues at these games, so it turning, it's turning into fights. They don't need to add to the toxicity. I'd prefer we just be a country that can get along and even, horror of horrors, see someone wearing a T-shirt <laughs> for a candidate they disagree with. Oh, horror of horrors. Brian, should they ban political messages in sports stadiums? Uh, Not on your shirts and your hats. I mean, you can't bring a sign or a banner in there. I just wonder if somebody would have walked in with a Harris Walls hat, if that person would have been, uh, you know, held up at the door. I bet they wouldn't have. But this is ridiculous. I'm glad they apologized. At least they did the right thing there. All right. A special thanks to Brian Bremberg and David Barnson for sticking it out for the entire hour. That applies to you, too, David. Thanks very much indeed.